A Texas family inherits a house full of history worth millions. Damn. Bob Davis was a, a world-class collector. He had a love affair with these items. That's smart. And speaking of love affairs... What's this gun? This is a sawed-off shotgun that was so. carried by the Barrow Gang. The Barrows? Like Bonnie and Clyde Barrows? Like Bonnie and Clyde. Their violent exploits spawn a legend. Those images of these young outlaws shooting up the highways of America somehow touches people. That may yield a fortune. The place is packed. People on the telephones are bidding. There's intense interest in the Bonnie and Clyde story. It was a mind blower to watch. I'm Jamie Colby and I'm headed into Waco, Texas, where I'll meet a man who inherited a massive collection of artifacts and documents and weapons that he says tell the story of the Lone Star State from the days of the Alamo all the way to the legendary and bloody crime sprees of the 1920s and 30s. I'm Earl Davis. My father, Robert E. Davis, died in March 2003 and left us a vast and eclectic collection. And we were at odds in the dilemma what to do with these items. I meet Earl Davis at his mother's house, where he keeps his strange inheritance. Hi, Earl. How are you doing? Are you Jamie? I'm Jamie. Nice Great to meet, to meet you. Good to meet you. Glad you're here. Earl tells me his father built a mom-and-pop printing business into a multi-million dollar operation successful enough to bankroll his real passion, Texana Artifacts. Well, there's a lot of stuff in here. This is a very nice autograph letter signed by Sam Houston in 1840, and, and you can see how nice his, Beautiful his signature, signature was. In the process, the family's home becomes a shrine to Texas history. The Alamo, the Battle of Zacatecas. There's even stuff going back to the Spanish conquistadors. This is a conquistador's helmet, all metal. I don't know how they wore it without a liner, but you can feel it's quite heavy. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine carting that on your head all day long? Yeah, if you're having a bad hair day, yeah, it takes care it of it. It will take care of your bad head day. <laughs> no doubt. There's more stuff. Come on, let, let me show you. More than this. More than this. we got several rooms. There are weapons everywhere. This is what I was talking about. Whoa, you promised guns. You got a lot of guns. Guns galore. What's this gun? This is a sawed-off shotgun that was so. carried by the Barrow Gang. The Barrows? Like Bonnie and Clyde Barrows? Like Bonnie and Clyde. You want to hold a piece of history? Whoa, it's heavy. Sawed Unbelievable. Off, we... Earl explains that the Barrow Gang accidentally left this weapon on the side of the road while changing a tire on their getaway car. Dad loved the whole Bonnie and Clyde story, didn't he? Loved he? the story. As we all do, it still holds up to today. And you have to wonder why. They killed a lot of people. Fascination with the Americana and the gangsters. 1930, Bonnie Parker, an unemployed waitress, meets Clyde Barrow in West Dallas. She's 19. Clyde's a year older and on the run from burglary charges. They are these mythical characters who did nothing but cause trouble and pain in their lifetime. It's a young boy and a young girl who went against the system. And by all accounts, it was love at first sight. The only thing that separated him was the uh, police arrested him and hauled him off to jail. Bonnie sneaks a revolver into the jail and Clyde makes a run for it. But he's recaptured, jailed, and beaten by the guards. He's released in 1932, a hardened criminal. He and Bonnie go on a rampage robbing banks and killing a dozen people. But all along, Clyde is consumed by one idea, revenge against the guards who beat him at Eastern Prison. Let's raid this place. Let's uh, uh, turn everybody loose, and I'd like to shoot every damn one of these guards. Clyde leads the raid in January 1934. Five convicts are released from prison, and one prison guard is killed. State Prison Chief Lee Simmons is humiliated. He calls on a retired Texas Ranger named Frank Hamer. He said, I told Frank Hamer, put Clyde and Bonnie on the spot and then shoot everyone in sight. Those are his own words. Hamer develops an informant who reveals the duo's location. The posse sets up an ambush. Clyde appears over a hill. 
Bonnie at his side. The lawmen open up with a deafening fusillade. Bonnie and Clyde are dead before they can return a single shot. In the death car, posse members uncover an arsenal. The inevitable end. Here is Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, who died as they lived, by the gun. To augment their meager pay, the officers take the weapons and other personal items. Frank Hamer wound up with all of the weaponry that was recovered in that car. It's no surprise to Earl that an avid collector like his father would covet these macabre trophies. Bonnie and Clyde, you can add it to a three-year-old kid and they know who Bonnie and Clyde is. Through sales, auctions, and trades, Robert adds that shotgun from the Barrow Gang to his house full of Texana artifacts, as well as Clyde's pocket watch and Bonnie's makeup case. But it's not enough. Robert eyes two more objects to cap off his gangster collection. A gun, 45, that was in Clyde's waistband. Another thing was a 38 taped to Bonnie's leg. Frank Hamer wrote a note that Bonnie was squatting on this gun. The smaller guns. It takes patience, luck, and One some quick another. thinking. But those two weapons will end up in Earl's strange inheritance. So, wow, he obviously got what he wanted. Yes, he always got what he wanted. <laughs> but this time, he almost blows it. Up next, Mrs. Davis's white-knuckle moment. Let's take it up a notch. What would she pay? And now, our strange inheritance quiz question. What was Clyde Barrow first arrested for? Stealing a case of beer? Failing to return a rental car? or stabbing a high school classmate? The answer in a moment.